Committee public hearing for the inquiry into the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the tourism and event sectors continues. Please ensure that mobile phones have been switched to silent and that background noise is minimised. I wish to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I wish to welcome any members of the public that are watching via the live broadcast. My name's Enver Erdogan and I'm chair of the committee. And I'd like to also acknowledge my fellow committee members present with us today. Mr. Rodney Barden, Mr. Mark Jeff, Mrs. Beverly MacArthur, Mr. Tim Coulty, Mr. Mr. Lee Talamas, uh, Mr. Dave Davis, Mr. Andy Medic, and Wendy, Mr. Wendy Lovell. If I've missed anyone, my apologies. Um, to all witnesses, all evidence taken at this hearing is protected by parliamentary privilege as provided by the Constitution Act 1975 and further subject to the provisions of the Legislative Council standing orders. Therefore, the information you provide during this hearing is protected by law. However, any comment repeated outside the hearing may not be protected. Any deliberately false evidence or misleading of the committee may be considered the contempt of par Parliament. All evidence is being recorded and you'll be provided for proof version of the transcript following the hearing. Transcripts will ultimately be made public and put on the committee website. We welcome your opening comments, but ask that they be kept to a maximum of five to 10 minutes to allow plenty of time for discussion. Could you please start by stating your name for the Hansard team and then begin your presentation? Over to you, Dean and Paul. Okay, Paul, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I'm Paul Lavaz. I'm the marketing and uh, guest services manager at Rich River Golf Club, which happens to be in Moama, New South Wales, but literally the very other side of the uh, Victorian border. Um, I'm here today also representing the uh, Chuka Moama Accommodation Association, which I'm the president of. Um, so I can give you a bit of a, uh, I guess, a, an idea of how we're going as a club, uh, being connected to a border community. Um, we derive 95% of our business out of Victoria. So we've been impacted greatly uh, in recent days and also 2020 and January and uh, every other lockdown or interruption that we've had uh, during that period of time. Um, just a little bit of a background on the Rich River Golf Club. We were coming into the new year, looking to start off really well, very optimistic about where we were heading. And then obviously we had the new year's lockdown and we lost uh, around 20 days of the biggest month of the year for us. And what we expected to make was about $200,000 in profit. We ended up losing $300,000 in that month alone. Um, so it was a $500,000 turnaround for our company. So we started the year a long way behind. Um, steadily, we started to pick a little bit of business up through February, March and April. But what we were always worried about as a company was the fact that June, July and August a traditionally very tough months for a Chuka Moama uh, with visitation, it obviously gets a bit colder. And unfortunately, we've started uh, June off uh, pretty poorly. We're running at about 2% occupancy. Um, we've gone from a weekend literally just gone where we might have turned over $220,000 to making about $60,000, $70,000. Our staff bill alone um, is eating up all of that money with no job keeper anymore. We've got to hold our staff. Uh, we're having huge staff issues here already. I think about 20% of um, the industry has probably been absorbed into other jobs. Um, I'm sure Dean will attest to it's very hard to hold on to your staff with the inconsistencies at the moment. And, and we, don't, we just don't have the money to carry them. Uh, the money that we were meant to have in the bank to get us through winter has been absorbed and eaten up uh, through 2020 and certainly the start of this year. So we're literally sitting on our hands at the moment, um, hoping just to be able to do business. But even business this time of year is 50% of what we would normally do. Uh, our accommodation at best runs at about 50%, similar to the rest of the accommodation association, uh, meaning that we do it pretty tough this time of year. So uh, without any business at all, no job keeper, uh, I'm going to have to have some hard conversations with staff. And if those staff find other jobs, when we do open up again, we end up getting an influx of business out of Melbourne because they're keen to obviously travel again. And we can't handle it because we've got untrained staff and we're short staff. So that's probably a bit of a snapshot of the Rich River Golf Club. As I said, I'm the president of the Accommodation Association. It's an industry that's on its knees here in Echuca, Um uh, Last year, 2020, 40 weeks out of the 52, literally um, there was something going on in the border. If it wasn't New South Wales shutting it down on their side, it was Victoria doing something on their side. Of course, that just impacted either side of the bridge. Uh, it also made Echuca Maima an extremely unpopular destination to travel to because 
One, if you're allowed into Moama, you weren't allowed into Echuca or you're going to be lined up on a bridge for the best part of an hour and a half to two hours. Um, you didn't want to come here because if you're in New South Wales and the government decided to call everyone in, there was every chance that you're going to have to leave your holiday destination and take off into Victoria and beat the deadlines as well. I know the Accommodation Association um, did it so badly last year that a lot of veterans that have been in the industry for 10 to 15 years that had, had built up very strong businesses are now back to where they started. They've borrowed, uh, borrowed and borrowed just to pay their debts off. And uh, we were always talking about June, July and August, again, being a critical months for us because we need to get through those three months to get back to tourism season again. And hence, as I speak, um, the entire super <laughs> accommodation is now empty and the Moama guys are running at about 5%. Um, there is no income. There is no job keeper to keep their staff. All of our cleaners are, are going to find something else to do. And as I said before, when we start again, uh, we're going to start again with no staff. And we're also starting again, completely refinanced, probably no money in the bank. And I fear that uh, we're going to lose a lot of good people to the industry, unfortunately. So that's kind of an overview of um, the two areas that I, I, I have something to do with here in the Chuka Moama. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that oversight. Um, would you like to say a few words, Dean? I just concur with what Paul's um, very well put forward. Uh, the comments are exactly the same as what we're facing. Um, I'm the managing director of uh, the American Hotel. We employ, we're um, a private business. Uh, we employ about 55 uh, staff, um, of which uh, we had uh, quite a number of uh, regional sponsored visa holders, uh, which were in skilled positions, head chef, sous chef, um, pastry and the like. Um, they didn't receive any support um, from any governmental assistance, which of course um, we, we looked after. They were unable because of the visa conditions um, not to seek employment anywhere else, of course, because they're, they're bound to us. So uh, with, the, with what money we didn't have and we did refinance and the like was to retain our staff um, and look after them. Um, that was uh, somewhat frustrating and, and disappointing in that there wasn't any any consideration of that. Then on the bounce on the back end of that, then of course you then start trading again in summer where where we are a very uh, dependent on the on the events and also the seasonality of tourism in regional Victoria. Um, the New Year's Eve lockdown, for example, uh, we had uh, we licensed for 600 people uh, with with the conditions, um, but we we got of course you get the announcement at 11 o'clock and then you wait for three or four hours for the actual government directions to actually quantify and then give you some sort of management around it. So we had uh, just inundated with with the questions which we couldn't answer because we were waiting for the detail. Um, so that was frustrating. That added a lot of stress. Um, I think of all the years that I've been doing hospitality. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I'm, I'm uh, the half glass full man anymore. Um, we've got, we've got, we have the boom months and all that sort of stuff. Don't get me wrong, but um, concurring with what Paul said was, you know, the 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 January wasn't what it should have been. It definitely December had the indications that it was all going in the right direction, and we're we're thinking, yeah, we can get through this. And then, of course, um, January sort of plateaued out. February was. Um, Flat as well, given that we normally have two major events in Chukamama being the music festival and also the Southern 80, which didn't didn't go ahead. Um, so normally, like a, a busy week, a normal week for us might be say 50, 100 to 100,000 plus turnover. Those big weekends and those busy weeks, we're sort of hitting the two and 300,000, which then of course enables you to pad out the the quieter periods. So. Again, JobKeeper started off um, reasonably well. Again, the frustrations and the anomalies with that were that um, a commie or a glassy at the American Hotel was getting far more was getting a lot of lot of support uh, on his twelve hours of casual employment versus a skilled uh, head chef that's got a family of five and is not getting any money at all. So, I think some of those frustrations uh, were there. Retaining your staff, very difficult. Um, I just said goodbye to a very talented pastry chef who, who were trained under um, under Marco Pierre White. Uh, he actually went out of the out of the frying pan into the fire. He's now up in the Highlands in Scotland because uh, this country and this experience has just mentally just exhausted him and busted him. So he's he's gone. Never to be seen or heard of again. So I guess the 
again, just arcing on the on the regional sponsored visas is that, you know, we've, I've been doing this, like I said, for 25 years and to get executive and, and uh, well-trained staff in those key positions that weren't being fulfilled by Australians, the regional sponsored visa guys filled that need and it was a real need. They weren't looked after and they're repurposed, they're gone and they're not coming back. So what does it look like on the recovery? Well, we've got kids in kids doing positions that they're not necessarily trained to do because we have to transact to get through. So it's not it's not where I thought I'd be at this age. I'm sorry. That's just how it is. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Brien and Mr. Uh, Lavaz for sharing the experiences of your businesses. I might actually go first and ask the first question. Then we'll go to Mr. Davis and then we'll go through uh, the list of committee members. Uh, my question was actually to Mr. Lavaz. Um, I noticed that your business is located in New South Wales. Did your business get any New South Wales government, uh, direct government support from the state government? No, no, that was, uh, again, the frustrations of the, the border. Never never in my life would I have thought that I'd notice um, a border so much as I have now. Uh, to be honest, if Victoria made a decision, because we get 95% of our business from Vic, New South Wales could quite easily say, well, it wasn't our decision. We didn't make it. So we're not going to pay anything there. There was no, I know Victoria did an accommodation um, subsidy uh, at one stage, but because it was Victoria that made the decision, New South Wales said to the accommodation providers here, sorry, we won't be doing the same thing there. So on one side of the bridge, they're getting $100 a room for every cancellation. On the New South Wales side in the same town, you're getting zero support. So uh, yeah, extremely frustrating. We, we have had numerous, numerous meetings with uh, different members of parliament that have come down and beat their chest and told us they're going to do something for us. And in all honesty, we haven't seen anything yet at all. Uh, JobKeeper 100% was a fantastic initiative that um, helped us get through. Um, but now we're, now we're running um, our own race here. Uh, we actually don't have weeks ahead of us. We probably have, uh, well, months ahead of us. We probably have two or three weeks before it really starts to turn into closures and, and job losses and that type of thing. So um, unfortunately, no. Thank, thank you for sharing that. I might pass it off to Mr. Davis and I remind all committee members to please ask one question. So I'll go Mr. Davis with Dr. Cumming. Uh, okay, look, can I thank both Dean and Paul and I want to ask whether they've got assistance during this round of closures, this current round. I noticed just before the hearing started, I went online and the Live Venue Hospitality Fund 2021 says it's opening soon. The Business Cost Assistance Program Round 2 says it's opening soon. Um, um, are people getting money through the state government program today or have they received anything this week is my question this week when it's urgent no no, no not, that not at all nothing not as that no and and when and when there is any assistance if there has been um some it can be very very long backdated um as you say the immediacy is now but often it's a long way down the track before there is any support or even talk of support so, I mean, if you, people go online now, they'll find that the, the grants are not open yet. Um, and yet this is a crisis in Victoria for businesses, for hotels, for accommodation, um, and not a Zach has flowed to, to your, your town. No. We asked in the parliament on the last sitting Wednesday, very directly, of the small business minister. She didn't have a fundamental then, and clearly not a Zach has flowed since. That's shocking. Thank you, Mr. Davis. You've asked the question, and I mean, both the witnesses or Mr. Lavar's answered. Uh, uh, Mr. Lebrun, um what's your answer? Do you have an answer as well? Uh, no, I'm not aware of any of any financial assistance being um, got. No, thank you very, very much. That's for that. shocking. I might pass over to Dr. Cumming, then we'll go to Mr. Talamas. Thank you, thank you Chair, and I, I thank um, both Dean. Um, as well as uh, the other, sorry, my questions around obviously gulp um, and um, I understand that there has been obviously a lot of conflicting information out there. If you can exercise, you can't exercise. Um, there was a, a raving debate here in Melbourne around that. Um, 
So I can understand uh, some of the issues that you've actually had across the border um, and how it must be affecting you. Uh, there are many in my community that feel that uh, they would just like consistent um, medical advice um, and consistent um, information around uh, restrictions. So um, my question to you is, uh, would it actually help to actually have that consistent advice from New South Wales and Victoria over the border so that both your communities can actually uh, work hand in hand in hand? Oh, uh, look, absolutely. You would like to think that um, before Victoria makes an announcement at 11 o'clock that they may have called the New South Wales government to tell them what that announcement's going to be. It, it kind of... It kind of feels like everyone watches TV and then tries to work it out from there. But uh, the, re the reality is, um, and I, I guess this is on the broader, broader spectrum, having a 4 p.m. deadline when Victoria's got a midnight deadline and everyone from Melbourne has a mass exodus in caravans over into New South Wales, it, it just creates issues that they're not on the same page. Uh, I guess in, a, in the Gulf... Oh, shit. Oh, no, I thought I was unmuted then, sorry. Um, I guess the, the biggest issue we have as a border town is even if golf is allowed to be used as sport in New South Wales, all our Truca members aren't allowed to visit us anyway. Um, so it ends up a huge problem. And uh, as, a, as a border town, it just doesn't work. Uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, Paul. I might pass on to Mr Talamas for a question and then we'll go to Ms McArthur. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Dean and Paul, for coming along and presenting to us today. Um, uh, my colleague uh, spoke, asked Paul about what support, if any, he'd received from the New South Wales government. My question is to Dean. Um, what Have you received any support from the Victorian government through any of the previous rounds of funding um, that's been... Uh, yeah, there, there's been... Um, I think there was uh, the, the outdoor dining... Uh, package of 5,000. I think there's touted now there's a 3,500 um, small business support thing on its way. Uh, there was further uh, a $30,000 um, government support as well previously. Um, so, yeah, that with JobKeeper, um, that, that would be the sum total of it. It was interesting with that live music uh, support grant, um, you know, I, I sort of think I, I thought I thought I was quite across the whole thing, but uh, it opened and closed, and and I missed out. And our live entertainment um, for our hotels about one hundred and eighty to two hundred thousand dollars a year, um, and then supporting employment of security staff of about the same as well. So I didn't see it. I'm a member of uh, Frontier Hospitality (AHA) and our lawyers down in Melbourne are fairly savvy and, and yeah, I just didn't see it coming, didn't see it, didn't get it. So to answer your question, uh, yes, yeah, some limited. I think um, when, when you're looking at the enormity and, and picking up on what Paul was saying, you know, a $3,500 grant, given the hole that we're looking at, with all due respects, it's not, not really um, going to sort of do much to help you. Dean, would it help to backdate those kind of things when they open and shut? Please, Dr. Cumming, one question. You've... Yeah, I think so. I, I, uh, it was quite clunky, the process. You had to apply for a thing, and I thought I'd actually completed the, the necessary uh, registration and the like, and then I followed it up, and then I was told, no, that was for just the registration of this, and, and I didn't complete it com correctly. So um, I'm I've, I've unaware of anyone who actually got that live music thing apart from the bigger venues in Melbourne. So, um, yeah. Have you, have you registered for the current grants that were announced? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. McArthur. Um, thank you, Chair. Gentlemen, can you tell me 15 months ago, this pandemic started and we, told, we were told we had to have lockdowns because our hospital system wouldn't cope. Do you think by now we should have been able to get a plan in place that would have enabled uh, business to continue and operate in a safe way uh, with our hospitals able to cope if there's an outbreak given at the moment we've only got one person in hospital? Paul, if I could start with that. We we were when it first when it first broke. Uh, there was lots of uh, providers of technology and and equipment. For example, you know we didn't know whether we had to temperature scan people on the way in, and then 
there was, you know, I was, I was investigating, I think it was a twenty or $30,000 piece of technology that then would uh, face recognise a client, a guest coming in, scan their temperature, apply that to, to, the, to the patron. So then, of course, we could then identify where they were with their temperature, were they compliant and all that sort of thing. And then all of a sudden, no, that's not required. You know, it's a couple of sanitizers and a bit of a QR code and, and, a, and a, you know, A4 of, you know, this is, this is your name. And, but those names, um, you know, Mickey Mouse had dinner here once, so did Donald Duck um, and the like. So it was quite, it was quite, uh, quite clunky and, and we didn't know what to expect. Now, 15 months down the track, um, I think that we've probably understand the, the situation on our hands far better, but it doesn't appear to have, there's no consistency of a platform across all the states. There's no, uh, as in like the, 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 the QR code readers and the like that you need to do. There's no patron management plan that is a, that is a necessity that needs to occur, whether it be a, a small cafe or a large venue uh, like ours. Um, there's, there's no rhyme or reason that the separations the my, my square meterage rates are different to New South Wales. So here I am to come to the American hotel, you need to have a mask, you need to sit down at a table, you have to have every second EGM turned off. Whereas you go over to the promised land, Paul, where Paul comes from, Moama, um, you can do whatever you like. You don't need to have a mask, you can have a beer, you can walk around and, and have a great time. So, you know, I feel a bit like, um, uh, you know, uh, David and Goliath. You know, and you know, I'm allowed to I'm allowed to be competitive, but I've got one hand tied behind my back, and and here we go again. So, you know, I I don't know. I, I'm not, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm having a soup, but it's um, it it is frustrating, especially when we are supposedly two towns acting as one, but over the states. But there is the the bubble. Yeah, the bubble was fine, but there's still there's still anomalies between Ichuka and Moama, and very confusing for the for the guests when they shut down on New Year's Eve. Um, you know, there was thousands, thousands and thousands of people which would have, you know, they, they don't just stay in Miami, they come to Echuca as well. So the, the knock-on uh, multiplier effects of, of uh, an economic gain that may have been done was neutralised. No. Thank, thank you for that, uh, for sharing that with us, Dean. I might pass over to Mr Quilty um, and then over to Mr Medic and Ms Lovell. Uh, I, I came in late, so I missed the presentation, so I won't ask a question. Thank you, Mr. Quilty. Uh, uh, Mr. Medic, do you have a question? Uh, I, I do. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. And I, I, I just want to ask you, Paul, at the moment, given and we, we talked about before and, and we had another witness earlier who, who talked about this and, and both of you gentlemen have so articulately put how, um, you know, there's this reliance on, on cross-border trade, um, you know, and, and agree. I mean, you know, reason I represent has the same with the South Australian border. Um, and look, do you, is there a feeling, Paul, that um, perhaps, you know, uh, and, and I don't know if this is actually what's come down from the New South Wales government, but is there a feeling that, you know, because you've said that you rely 95% on Victorian trade, that perhaps the New South Wales government has sort of gone, well, you know, you, you get all your business from Victoria, mate. If you want money, ask the Victorian government for funds, not us. Is that the kind of feeling that you get? Uh, not necessarily. We, we, when it first happened, we actually tried to come up with some practical solutions in, in regards to uh, maybe even putting the border, so to speak, 100 kilometres past the town. We, we, we sent some maps and we showed where the access points were with the roads, just so that we could continue to do business. Because forget, forget business in general. You've got primary school kids who live in Moama and Echuca just trying to go to school. You've got them doing sports. You've You've got my my family, my wife and I live in Moama. My daughter and my grandchildren live in Echuca. So the reality is the town is so interconnected in every single breath that we take that it's actually impossible to put people, police on the bridge and expect us all to function. So I, I guess where we get the support from, um, I'd like to think I live in Australia and I'm an Australian and that the, um, we're not seen as separate states as, as much as we are now and that they might actually break this down into an individual approach because today I can't see why a coffee shop is closed down in Mildura when it's nearly 800 kilometres away from the nearest case. Um, I'd like to see them have some other approaches opposed to the one in all in approach because the reality that's going to send us all broke. I, I think um, if we were open for business today and we were able to cross our borders and the golfers could come here from Echuca and play their golf today 
and whether that's for exercise or whether the other thing that we don't talk about is the mental anguish that is happening in society. It's actually starting to get heavy on people's <laughs> shoulders. And I think that, um, I think that the approach now, which is just a, a, you're all being shut down because we haven't got the capacity to do this properly, is just something they're going to have to stop having unless they bring JobKeeper or something else in. The reality is we can't finance this second wave or third wave now. Um, and that's the reality. Thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you. The fourth wave for the rest of the... Oh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you uh, for your uh, uh, frank answer. Um, I might pass on to Miss Lovell, then Mr Barton. Thanks very much, guys, for your presentation and um, being a um, resident of the border communities. I understand all of your frustrations. Dean, I noticed that the um, number of uh, grants that you said you'd received other than JobKeeper, which was ongoing, if you added them all up together, they wouldn't um, probably cover a good weekend's takings at the American Hotel. But this latest lockdown has come uh, at a time when the voucher system for travel into regional Victoria expired on Monday. And I just wondered if you could tell us about the uh, whether you think that there needs to be more incentives for to bring people into regional Victoria to restore their confidence to travel um, to regional locations. And also, Dean, if you can tell us about the effects that, of this lockdown on your business and also if there, we were to... Um, lockdown for the long weekend. I know you'll be holding your breath right up until the moment you're pulling those beers and serving the meals on the long weekend in June. Yeah, so um, the, 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 the five-day shutdown in February and then now we've had the seven plus, I think there's more coming. Um, it's, it's a significant amount given that May, June, sorry, May and June, as Paul said, are very quiet months and we are dependent on the Queen's birth, on, on sorry, the long weekend, uh, and also um, we have a winter blues festival in late July. Um, these, these, these lockdowns are, are really tough because we haven't got any support at all. Um, the staff are, are incredibly anxious because again, there's no, this is the period that we're looking at. It's, 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 it's not based on anything. We don't know. We don't know. It's, it's not dependent on a particular piece of information occurring or, or, or the like. In relation to getting people to come back out to regional Victoria, um, I think we suffer as a border town because of again that that um, anomaly of what is going to be with the border. You come to Echuca, Miami, you don't just come to Echuca. So if there is some concerns about the border being closed or the or the like, then there's a real there'd be a real reservation to use your voucher, not necessarily in Echuca, Miami, but it might be somewhere else in regional Victoria that hasn't got that potential risk of not necessarily having the experience that you thought you were going to get in the, in the border town. So I think uh, we, we do suffer um, both sides, Moma and Ichuka, because of the border that is dividing and then the, the, uh, the offer for the tourism on both sides is, is codependent on each other as an as a ultimate experience. So do you think it would be beneficial if the state government actually extended those vouchers for interstate people to be able to use them? There's still a number of committee members that haven't had the opportunity to ask a question. So um, if we get time at the end, I'm sure you, I'm happy to pass them to you to ask a supplementary. But at this stage, I know Mr Bard and Mr Jen have not even had a question uh, to these witnesses. So if we get an opportunity, I'll come back if that's OK. Uh, Mr Barton, would you like to go, please? Um, Sorry, Chair. Yep. Yeah, I do. Um, I, I feel their frustration, and I am absolutely familiar with both of your businesses because I've frequented them both. Um, Come back again, mate. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, I'm doing my best, mate. <laughs> um, but look, one of one of the frustrations, and I understand your frustrations, and, and and this is a frustration across all small businesses. But I, I've just, and the reason I'm saying this is because I've just got a, a, an email from my cousin in London who's, um, uh, I have more family in London and New York than I do in Australia, right? And um, we don't have a crystal ball, right? And I know the frustration about trying to, to plan ahead. Um, and I, the number that sticks in my mind is the day when we got to 750 people, um, so did London. Now, before anybody says, oh, yeah, but... 
and, and that they've exploded. Now, before anybody says that the, um, oh yeah, they've got three times the population. Well, if we, if we kind of average that out and work it out, they've had over 100,000 people die in, um, in the UK. Um, that would put us up around 30,000. Um, I don't know how you don't, um, not, not you guys, <laughs> I don't know how as a government, um, they have a sense of responsibility to keep us as safe as they can. And it's really, really tough to make that call, right? Um, do I agree with the call that coffee shops in Mildura should be shut? No, I don't. You know, surely we could we could um, prioritise this. But, you know, government's made the call and they do so on the health advice. So what, what I'm trying to say to you is that, you know, how we manage, how can we manage these uh, immediate lockdowns? Because, you know, that Kahuna incident could have easily have turned into a case. And that then could have spread out through your entire area and absolutely devastated um, the entire border communities. So what would you like to see? Because uh, I don't know, but my crystal ball doesn't tell me <laughs> where, where this COVID's traveling. Um, so how do we manage um, and, and, and try and control um, when we do have to shut the areas down? How do you want to see it done? Well, I guess um, this is a, a bigger question, but uh, I guess in a selfish point of view, um, I think the world showed us what COVID does. We have had 18 months to look at just how bad it can get. And I feel that Australia got itself to a very safe environment, but keep taking the risk with our borders, our, our Australian borders, letting people in. We, were, we do know our quarantine um, isn't up to scratch. We've already had three or four or five warnings there. We've got ventilation systems that don't quite work. Um, now, look, the, the, the horse... Around the country. Around the, the, country. The, horse, the horse has bolted and COVID's yeah. in society. So now back to, the, I guess, the lesser question, which is how do we, when it does come out, as you said before, Kahuna could have turned into two or three cases. So could have Bendigo at the hairdressers. So could have uh, this New South Wales case today and the, and the Euroa visit and wherever else it's going. It's, it's certainly very deadly and we understand that. I suppose how long... How long do areas without COVID suffer? I just feel like it needs to be a bit of a more individualistic approach. I mean, I know as a business person myself, if you said to me, you are not allowed to accept anybody with a postcode or from this area at all to your business, um, and there weren't these 4 p.m. deadlines and all the other things that go around it, we want to keep our businesses open. We will do anything we can to keep our business open. So what we need is our laws to be a little bit stronger. And, and the only reason people pour up here from Melbourne is they're allowed to. And, and, and Bunnings can be open all day without people QR scanning in and doing everything else. And multinational stores have made mega millions of dollars through these lockdowns and they've received JobKeeper as well. Yep. So um, again, I know the word common sense kicks in, but um, I just feel like now it just can't be a one and all approach because we've run out of money. I agree with what Paul said. I think I think if we're if a business has got particular compliancy levels that they're they're meeting and and the like, well then why can't we why can't we continue to trade? Albeit that there will be cases and the like, but the all one in all in approach is just killing us. Absolutely killing us. And there's no motivation on an economic sense to be more compliant or to have the you know the gold the gold stamp so you can continue to do. You know the coffee. The coffee shop is 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 going ahead in leaps and bounds, and the, the big businesses like ours uh, can't do anything. We're just watching it all go by. Yeah. Oh, no, thank you, guys. That's yeah. It's a very difficult situation. Thank you. I know Miss Lovell had a supplementary question, and we've got exactly two minutes. So I'll pass over to Miss Lovell to ask her final question. Thank you. Uh, so it was just around the vouchers and whether it would be beneficial if they were reinstated, but also if they were extended to offer New South Wales people the opportunity to apply for vouchers to be spent in Victoria, Dean. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's a great question. Like there's a, there's a massive amount of uh, regional support that we get from regional New South Wales into Victoria. And conversely, New South Wales gets the same from us. Southern New South Wales gets the same from Victoria. The voucher system, I don't know why it's got an expiry date on it. Like it should be, you know, let's get it going and let's, let's, let's get people out here transacting and seeing what we've got. And we're, we're, we're fans and we should be together. 
Absolutely, and we need it over our quiet months in the winter. So, you know, yeah. that's why we run run the Blues Festival in July to bring people to yeah. the area. So, it would be very beneficial. Can I, can I add something to that, if that's okay? Um, obviously, at New South Wales, we we received the dine and discovery vouchers. So, they got two twenty five dollar dine vouchers and two twenty five dollar discovery vouchers, which could be used. Uh, two of them could be used for eateries if you're registered. So, we registered, of course. And the other two vouchers could be used for things like attractions and zoos and that type of thing. Um, we've done okay out of those vouchers uh, because obviously all of Moama that went and registered for that have got two $25 vouchers, which they want to use. So they're coming in and basically if they have a $25 palmy, it's money in our hand and it's a free feed for them as far as they're concerned. I think what you're saying with the vouchers is absolutely something strategic around the quieter times would be fantastic because just like I'm in marketing at Rich River Golf Club, uh, my job is to make us busier when we're quiet. And these sorts of things can do that for us. So I, I definitely encourage the voucher system, but, I, but on border towns, it needs to cross over to both. You can't be watching everyone in New South have a free feed while in the truck and they're not getting anything. So um, somehow it'd be nice if it across borders. Which I uh, your place. Thank you very much. On, on that note, uh, the committee's now going to take a short break. On behalf of the committee, I wish to thank you both, Mr. Dean Oberin and Mr. Paul Lovars, and thank you to the American Hotel at Chuka and the Rich River Golf Club and Resort Moama. I think it's been very insightful and we've enjoyed your contributions. Thank you for presenting today. No problems. Thanks, Thanks. very much, guys.